Welcome to Math with Professor V. Here's a surface area problem that I solved for my Calculus 2 class yesterday, and then I mentioned to them that it would be quite a bit simpler if you just used hyperbolic functions. So they asked me to share the solution with them, and that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So find the area of the surface generated by revolving the curve about the given axis, and we have y equals e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. They give me the bounds on x, and we're spinning around the x-axis. So I know from my surface area formula, it's going to equal 2 pi. Limits of integration, we'll leave them in terms of x, 0 to natural log of 4. If I'm spinning around the x-axis, the radius is going to be y times, and then I have square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. All right, that's your basic skeleton of the formula. And then later on, we'll work on cleaning up this expression here. And then since we're integrating with respect to x, and none of us are in Calc 3 yet, we're going to replace y with how it's originally defined in terms of x. But I did mention, hey guys, I know we don't work with hyperbolic functions so frequently, but this is actually hyperbolic cosine. So just if you'll recall, hyperbolic cosine, which we lovingly refer to as cosh x, is equal to e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2, which is what y is equal to for this particular problem. So let's proceed and use some hyperbolics instead because it will make the calculations a lot cleaner. Uh, first thing, I want to figure out all of the stuff that's going to go underneath the radical, the 1 plus dy dx squared. Okay, so I need a derivative. So I need to take dy dx or find y prime. Derivative of hyperbolic cosine, do you happen to know what it is? Why, well, yes, it's hyperbolic sine, cinch x. Okay. And then underneath the radical, we have 1 plus dy dx squared, right? So this is going to be 1 plus cinch x squared. Very good. Now, that can be replaced with one of our identities. Yes. So for the hyperbolic functions, the equivalent is we have cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals 1. Remember, with our normal trig functions, we have cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1, right? But hyperbolics are based on a hyperbola, the unit hyperbola, so that's why they have that minus sign there. So I can replace 1 plus cinch x squared, or 1 plus cinch, I have to really think hard when I'm writing, squared x with, that's right, cos squared x. Okay, now what's so great is that's the quantity that's going to go underneath the radical. Perfect. Okay, and then we can work on cleaning up the rest. Okay, so now let's rewrite our integral. So we have surface area equals 2 pi integral 0 to ln of 4. And then notice here I told you we were going to have to replace this y to be defined in terms of x, but I don't have to actually write out e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. I know that that's equal to cosh x. So that's exactly what I'm going to replace that with right now. So we have here in the front cosh x times the square root of cosh squared x dx. All right. Now, technically, Square root of cosh squared x is absolute value of cosh x. But do you remember what the graph of hyperbolic cosine looks like? Probably not, so let me show you right now. So here's the graph of hyperbolic cosine. As you can see, it's the one right here in pink. And I'm just showing how it's put together from 1 half e to the x plus 1 half e to the negative x. The important thing to know about it, though, is that it's never negative, right? And that it obtains its minimum at 0, 1. So that means in the integral, since we have absolute value right here, it's not necessary. We can drop the absolute value. This quantity here is never going to be negative. Isn't that great? Okay. 
So back to the problem at hand, we can rest at ease. We don't need the absolute value. And now I have two pi integral zero natural log of four. Here's one hyperbolic cosine. Here's one more hyperbolic cosine. So I have cos squared x dx. All right, very lovely. Now, how do you integrate cos squared x? That's the question. Well, very similar to how we integrate cosine squared x. Remember, we replace it with our half angle identity. And lucky for us, the identity is identical. So we have 2 pi 0 to natural log of 4. I'm going to replace cos squared x with 1 half times. Ooh, let me fix that too. It's looking so forlorn. 1 half times 1 plus cos 2x dx. All right, very good. And then from here, just go about your day and integrate. I'm gonna take the one half out with the two pi, so I just have a pi outside. And then now we can go term by term, antiderivative of one is just x, and then antiderivative of cos two x would be one half cinch two x. And this all gets evaluated from zero to natural log of four. So then we have pi times natural log of four plus one half cinch two ln of four minus zero minus one half cinch two x. <gasps> zero, I meant zero, excuse me more. All right, now from here, you do need to go back to your definition for hyperbolic sign so that you can simplify and get the final answer. So allow me to remind you, cinch of x is equal to e to the x minus e to the negative x over two. So over here, I need to evaluate cinch of two natural log of four and cinch of zero. So let's do that. So cinch of two ln of four and this is just a side. This is just me doing some computations, okay? Cinch of two ln of four would be e to the two ln of four minus e to the negative two ln of four over two. And then what I need to do next is move the coefficients, make them exponents so I can simplify using log properties. So this is now e to the ln of four squared minus e to the ln of four to the negative second over two, which is gonna be 16 minus 1 16th over two. This is gonna be what? 256 minus one, so 255 over 32. All right, so all of this right here is 255 over 32, and then I still have times that one half. And then the other term I need to evaluate, where are you? Right here, cinch of zero. That won't be so tricky. So we have now cinch, oh, I forgot my H, of zero. That's going to be e to the zero minus e to the negative zero over two. One minus one over two. So that's just zero. Okay. So this guy's gone. That's zero. Bam. All I have is pi times ln of 4 times 1 half or plus 1 half times 255 over 32. So let's put it all together. So now we have pi times ln of 4 plus 1 half times 255 over 32. And then this ends up being pi times natural log of 4 plus 255 over 64. Okay, and that is considerably less work than if you just went for it directly. I did that in class, the, so they've already seen it. I'll do it now if anyone's interested to see how things would look differently, right, if you were not to use your hyperbolics, okay? But this was the, this was the exciting part that I didn't finish in class yesterday. So if we, didn't recognize or didn't want to use the hyperbolics, right? Could we continue? 
Yes, of course. So remember, y was equal to, it was e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. So I would rewrite this as 1 half e to the x plus 1 half e to the negative x. And then now I'm going to go ahead, find dy dx as is, not using hyperbolics. Going term by term, this would be 1 half e to the x minus 1 half e to the negative x. And then the next part in my formula is I need to compute 1 plus dy dx squared. So it's going to be 1 plus this entire quantity squared. So make sure you remember to foil the whole thing, right? Expand it. There's going to be a middle term. So I have 1 plus 1 half e to the x squared would be 1 fourth e to the 2x minus 2 times... The middle term is going to be 1 half e to the x times 1 half e to the negative x, and then double that. Plus, square the last term, that's going to be 1 fourth e to the negative 2x. All right, now hopefully you notice this pattern comes up a lot. e to the x and e to the negative x cancel out, because you add the exponents together, you'll just get e to the 0, which is 1. And then 2 and 1 half here cancel. So all I'm left with, is one half for that middle term, actually a negative one half. So now I have one plus, let me switch so you can see the pattern, one fourth e to the two x minus a half plus one fourth e to the negative two x. Okay, so what I want you to really hone in on is that when I multiplied out this quantity, I got this trinomial right here. Are we good? That's a perfect square trinomial. Fabulous. Now the next step, hopefully you've seen before, since you're working on arc length and surface area, I can add one and negative one half. And then now I'm going to have one fourth e to the two x plus one half plus one fourth e to the negative two x. And now this trinomial looks exactly like the perfect square trinomial up above. It's just we have a plus one half instead of a minus one half. We'll think back. Where did this perfect square trinomial come from? From squaring this quantity. Therefore, this trinomial will factor into something that looks exactly like this squared. It's just we're going to switch this to addition since we have a plus one half here. And that's the common trick that comes up a lot in arc length as well as in surface area problems. So this is going to be plus one half e to the negative x squared. Okay, good. So then now we have everything all together. Surface area is going to be 2 pi integral 0 to ln of 4. And then remember, instead of writing y, I'm going to replace it with how y was defined in terms of x, so it's e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2 times, and then I have right here this 1 half e to the x plus 1 half e to the negative x squared, and that's actually underneath the radical still in the integral, and then here's dx. All right, lovely. Now, this square root will cancel with the exponent there, which is perfect for us. And then while I'm at it, are you all okay if I cancel this two with the two outside? Oh, you are. Thank you so much. So zero to ln of four, e to the x plus e to the negative x. And then all I have left now is one half. I'm going to write this as e to the x plus e to the negative x all over 2. Why am I doing that? I really, really want to take this 2 outside, okay? And then we're, we're getting close. Pi over 2, 0 to ln of 4. Do you see how these are the same quantity? So I just have e to the x plus e to the negative x all squared dx. Whew! Okay, we're almost there, guys. We're almost there. Hang on. So we're going to foil this out. So pi over 2, 
zero to ln of four, I'll have e to the two x plus e to the x times e to the negative x is gonna be e to the zero, which is one, and then I double it, square the last term, it's e to the negative two x dx. And then now we're ready, we can integrate this is 1 half e to the 2x plus 2x minus 1 half e to the negative 2x from 0 to ln of 4. Hallelujah. Okay, time to plug in our limits of integration. So we've got pi over 2, 1 half e to the 2 ln of 4 plus 2 ln of 4 minus 1 half e to the negative 2 ln of 4, minus 1 half e to the 0, minus 0, plus 1 half e to the 0. Okay, and then we're at a similar place when we had switched back from our hyperbolics at the end of the problem. You're going to move those coefficients to be exponents. So then all of this is just e to the ln of 4 squared, which is 16, okay? Since we've already done this, I'm just going to carry on. You should know your log properties pretty well by now anyway. So plus 2 ln of 4 minus 1 half times, that's going to cancel out to 4 to the negative second, which is just going to be, yes, 1 over 16. And then this minus 1 half e to the 0 cancels with plus 1 half e to the 0. So that's done. Okay, so now what do we have? Pi over 2 times 16 over 2, that's 8 over 1, plus 2 ln of 4 minus 1 over 32. If I get a common denominator, multiplying this by 32 top and bottom, 8 times 32 is going to be 256. So I have 256 minus 1 over 32 plus 2 ln of 4 with a pi over 2 outside. And then we're almost there, guys. Hang in there. Pi over 2 times 255 over 32 plus 2 natural log of 4. And then... Let's just distribute that one half through so that it can cancel with the two in front of the natural log. So we have 255 over 64 plus ln of four. And then now it also matches exactly the answer we got when we did it with the hyperbolic function. So I wanted it to be matchy matchy perfect. All right, which method do you think was easier? Well, look at how much work it took here. Okay, this was not using hyperbolics, and then this was the work using hyperbolics. I think, I think using hyperbolics was a lot more straightforward, a lot cleaner. It's just a matter of do you remember those derivatives and identities well enough to work with them. So a lot of the time students say, why do we even learn them? Because they are very useful, and they come up in a lot of application problems especially real world problems that involve engineering and other things, bridge, suspension, whatnot. But typically you learn trig functions first and they're just more commonly used. So yes, these little hyperbolics fall by the wayside. However, I thought this was interesting to see how beautiful they can be. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already. And then if you need help with any of the other topics in Calc 1, 2, or 3, I have full video lectures for every section. They're organized into playlists on my YouTube channel. So just browse around, have a ball. And you can also follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, Math with Professor V. I love you all. I'll be back soon. Bye.